Greetings and welcome. Uh, you probably are wondering why, why is this guy talking so funny and why is he at the Royal Stat Society for this uh, for this this gathering? Uh, I'm John Baylor. I'm part of the Stats and Stories team, and we're we're podcasters that that are based in the U.S. Uh, we we've we've been telling the statistics behind the stories and the stories behind the statistics since about 2013. Uh, we've also been partnering with with our friends at at Significance Magazine and particularly Brian Taran since oh gosh it's probably been four or five years now that we've been been featuring uh, stories that have have shown up in Significance. Uh, we're going to be going we're 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 recording live to tape today. So we're going to have two guests that will be joining us in two segments. And as part of those two segments, what you're going to, to do is be able to ex you know, listen to these conversations, but then participate in the conversations. And the chat window will be open and available for you to weigh in and, and ask questions of these two outstanding speakers that will be joining us today. Uh, we uh, Rosemary Pennington is the moderator for our program, and Brian Taran is going to be my, my partner in crime on the panel mm -hmm. today. So I'm going to turn it over to Rosemary and let her, you know, Get this ball rolling. We live at a curious moment when data and information from a variety of sources overwhelm our senses and when there are people who are working to manipulate some of that data spreading disinformation and discord. This has led to a skepticism and distrust of data that can make it difficult to find common ground and which, when it comes to public health, may make us all unsafe. Overcoming that distrust and helping people see how the world adds up is the focus of this episode of Stats and Stories coming to you from the annual meeting of the Royal Statistical Society. I'm Rosemary Pennington. Stats and Stories is a production of Miami University's Departments of Statistics and Media, Journalism and Film, as well as the American Statistical Association. Joining me as panelists today are John Baylor, Chair of Miami Statistics Department, and Brian Taran, Editor of Significance Magazine. Our guest today is Tim Harford. Tim is the author of the books Messy and the best-selling The Undercover Economist. He's also a senior columnist at the Financial Times and the presenter of Radio 4's More or Less, the series 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, and the new podcast Cautionary Tales. He's an associate member of Newfield College, Oxford, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. Tim was made an OBE for services toward improving economic understanding in the New Year honors of 2019. He has a new book coming out called How to Make the World Add Up, 10 Rules for Thinking Differently About Numbers, designed to, quote, convince you that statistics can be used to illuminate reality with clarity and honesty, end quote. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Rosemary. I guess to, just to start our conversation, why did you feel compelled to write this particular book? Well, I've been presenting more or less on the BBC for 13 years now, and that is a program a little bit like Stats and Stories. It's a, it's a, a program uh, about trying to make sense of the world through numbers. And so it seemed natural to, to write a book about how to use statistics to make sense of the world. But for a long time, I just, just couldn't quite face writing that book. Uh, I didn't think I had anything new to say. There are so many good books out there already about explaining how statistics work and how to understand them. And um, it was really the experience of uh, covering recent uh, political elections in the US and in the UK, uh, a very contentious Brexit referendum in the UK, that made me start to question what we were doing and, and how we were doing it. And then maybe it wasn't enough to simply um, shoot down uh, falsehoods to just be doing fact checking, which, which was never the only thing that more or less did. But that sometimes you could explain what the data showed and people just didn't have any interest whatsoever in listening. And that, that's really what started the ball rolling the process of, of working on, on this book, How to Make the World That Up, uh, trying to help people think about uh, the, the filters and the biases and the, the wishful thinking and the political ideology and all of the ways in which we, uh, we perceive the world around us that will affect our ability to use statistics to perceive reality clearly. So it's, it's part a book about statistics, but it's, it's partly a book of trying to help people be wiser about themselves. I, I love that you started with this comparison of 1954 stories. 
you know, the the Huff book about how to lie with statistics running counter to the Richard Dahl and Austin Bradford Hill smoking and lung cancer piece. What, when did you hook on to that as, as kind of this, this parallel story to be told about the, the value of, of evidence? Well, I, I was struck by an article published in Significance magazine a few years ago, um, just pointing out that uh, Daryl Huff, the author of this great book, is a wonderful book, How to Lie with Statistics, had actually ended up shilling for big tobacco. Uh, and that, that was a, struck me as a sad footnote to somebody who loved that book. Um, but the more I looked into it, the more I realized that there's really a, a, um, a very important and complex story going on here. Um, on the one hand, you have half, I know many people uh, listening to this podcast, many people watching this conference session will, will know about Daryl Huff's book, How to Lie with Statistics, and, it, and what a great little book it is. It's funny and it's insightful. They'll know about that. Um, they won't know necessarily Huff's uh, role in the, in the tobacco industry, the fact that he showed up at a, a Senate hearing and with a little story plucked out of his book about how there's a really solid correlation between storks and babies and, and tried to suggest that the, you know, the same thing is true of cigarettes and, and cancer. Um, what really struck me though is, is at the same time as you've got Huff with the, I think really what the traditional approach to popular statistics is what Huff did, which is to come up with lots of examples of the media getting statistics wrong, politicians lying with statistics, advertisers lying with statistics, and to shoot them all down. Mm. Uh, that vision of statistics contrasted with what Austin Bradford Hill and Richard Dole were doing in the same year, which was to yeah. use statistics to produce one of, not the only, but one of the first compelling pieces of evidence that smoking cigarettes is uh, dram dramatically increases your risk mm. of lung cancer. And the, just the, the contrast between those two ideas, like statistics are a trick and I'll show you how to see the trick versus mm -hmm. statistics are a tool uh, that show you very important things about the world that we couldn't perceive in any other way. And maybe we should be thinking about how to use the tool rather than just how to spot the trick. Yeah, it's a, uh, the book, Tim, I was very uh, lucky to be sent a. Uh, uh, early version of it. It's a fantastic read. And uh, what struck me actually was the the fact that the, the book almost, I mean, we, we start with the story of Daryl Huff, um, but then it, you go on to look at your 10 rules about statistics. And you don't start by saying, you know, rule number one is not whether this statistic makes sense or not, or whether what does it actually mean? It's how does, how does this statistic make you feel? It's, you know, search your feelings. Why is that so important, do you think? Yeah, well, it was just the, the experience of all of the fact checking during all of these political campaigns made me realize that the leading uh, predictor of what somebody is going to think about anything is what is their emotional reaction. Uh, that, you know, whether you're, you know, pro Trump, anti Trump, pro Brexit, anti Brexit, uh, pro vaccine, anti vaccine, these debates aren't about facts fundamentally. First and foremost, they're about emotions, about uh, political tribal identity, about quite deep primal feelings about the world. And so what is the point of writing a book that tells people how to use statistics to understand the world unless we first face that head on? And, and so that's why the first piece of advice is to recognize your own emotions. And I, I tell a story about absolutely astonishing art forgery that was not a very good forgery that fooled one of the greatest art critics in the world because he got emotionally carried away. So the technical expertise is not gonna save you if you let your emotions get away with you. So that's why I emphasize that. Of course, we can't um, and, and probably shouldn't want to ignore our emotions, ignore our uh, political beliefs and preconceptions, uh, our, our, our cultural identity. I mean, these are all part of who we are and how we think. We can't get away from that. But we should at least notice it. And I found it personally really helpful when I'm on Twitter. I will no longer just, uh, as I used to five, six years ago, just retweet a graph or a claim that feels right to me and that makes a point that I approve of and I would like to be more broadly appreciated. That I, I, I notice, well, hang on, I'm having an emotional reaction to this claim. This claim is making me feel vindicated, or, or in contrast, this claim is making me feel defensive. I can't believe it's true. And simply to notice that 
before I do anything else. I think it takes some of the sting, the, the, the power of the emotions out of it. And then once you've done that, then you can start doing the really interesting stuff, which is to think about what the claim means and whether it's true or not. So, so you're advocating thoughtful use of social media, Tim? <laughs> I mean, I'm just... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, this, this is horrifying. You might destroy this whole whole industry. <laughs> yeah, social media doesn't always help, but I mean, of course, there are two sides to 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 all of this. And people complain about social media. Yeah, yeah, people complain course. about our blogging and all of this stuff and all the disinformation that's out there. But one of the points I make later in the book is, if you are curious and you want to know the truth, once you've got past that emotional reaction. It's never been easier to find you know, really thoughtful, informed uh, commentary from genuine experts with sources just to click away. You just don't need to have the motivation, the curiosity to want to go that extra click. And it's, it's all out there for anybody. It's a, I mean, it's a wonderful time to be curious about the world, really. But then uh, I think another important argument you make in, in your book is there's almost like a lack of curiosity as, uh, or, 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 you know, in the world today and that we're not, people aren't quite in that sweet spot. Do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about that and what, and what you see as the problem there? So some people are curious and some people aren't. And of course, some people are curious about some things and not curious about other things. Um, so I don't want to make some, some sweeping generalization that we're less curious than we used to be. I don't know if that's true. But I, I have been um, really struck by two things. One is the research of a group at uh, Yale University uh, led by Professor Dan Kahan, who studies uh, political cognition, the way we think about political identity and cultural identity. And one of the things he's found is that um, there's almost no antidote to political tribalism except uh, curiosity. You can measure curiosity. He particularly focuses Focuses is on, it focuses in on scientific curiosity, curiosity about the scientific world, which is different to scientific education or scientific literacy. And he finds that people who are curious about science tend to be less politically polarized. They're not as defined by their, their political identities as, say, a Republican or a Democrat as everybody else is. And that seems to be partly because um, if you see a surprising claim that threatens your political identity, most people view that as, as threatening. I, I don't want to see this claim. I don't want to hear any more of it because it's threatening my sense of who I am and that my sense that I'm on the right side of things. But if you're a scientifically curious person, you see a surprising claim. You go, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. I want to know more, show me more. So that was a very striking thing. But the other thing was simply to reflect about what, from the point of view of personal experience, really great communication about technical subjects looks like, whether we're talking about um, the natural world, whether we're talking about astrophysics, whether we're talking about economics, my own field, or statistics, or whatever it is, we tend to think as, as geeks, I'm proudly a geek, uh, we tend to think that if you, if you just explain things really clearly, slowly and clearly, that's the key to good communication. But then when you think about the great uh, communicators about science. I mean, think back to Carl Sagan, for example. Um, it's not about clear communication. It's about really inspiring that sense of curiosity, really driving people to want to find out more about the world. So I, I've been telling my fellow economists, we need to be more like someone like David Attenborough or Carl Sagan in the way we communicate. It's not just about clarity. You're listening to Stats and Stories, recording at the annual meeting of the Royal Statistical Society. Our guest is Tim Harford, whose latest book, How to Make the World Add Up, is meant to help us all better understand the importance of good statistical data in our lives. Tim, you mentioned this as we were sort of moving into the break, this idea that maybe you should be more people in your field should be more like Carl Sagan or um, Attenborough. So I wonder how you, because you studied philosophy, philosophy and economics, and yet are writing for the Financial Times and you know, have written a book that I think a review called, said the, the writing was enthralling. Um, so I wonder how you sort of made that shift and, and how you, you approached um, you know, writing for a more popular audiences and how that became sort of something that you were, were focused on. Yeah, well, I, I think I stumbled into it, to be honest. So my first piece of, of public writing was, was a book called The Undercover Economist. 
which um, is what unlocked uh, becoming a presenter on radio and, and becoming a newspaper columnist. And The Undercover Economist was really just a book of me going around the world, noticing things that I thought were interesting and trying to figure out what they were, what was really going on using the economics that I'd been taught at university. So you could sit in a Starbucks looking at, or I would sit in a Starbucks, look at the pricing menu of a Starbucks and, and try to figure it out, what, what's going on, and discover interesting things like, turns out there's a, there is a special um, size of Starbucks coffee that's smaller than, the, than all the other sizes and cheaper and that's not advertised. So why does that exist? And why don't they tell you it exists? What's going on? It's not some great conspiracy, but you know, there's a thing going on there that I personally wanted to, to find out. Um, and in many ways, it wasn't great journalism. I didn't call up Starbucks and ask them for comment or talk to any great experts about coffee pricing. I was just trying to figure it out myself and wrote it all down. And that turned out that that struck a chord. Um, but more generally, one of the things I've been trying to do um, with the team on more or less, so it is a big team effort, is to get people to think about uh, you know, what, what, what else can we, where else can we go with a particular factual claim? Because it's very easy to, to use as a hook. Uh, oh, a politician has said a thing and that thing's not true. Super easy. Uh, and to explain that it's not true. So there's lots of fact checkers who serve a very important role in the world uh, doing that because facts matter. But I want to do more uh, than just do that with more or less. I want people to understand what's true about the world rather than just what's not true about the world. And that very quickly gets you to you know, a, a place where you're going, okay, well, if we don't have the answer, how can we get the answer? What data can we find? Who's looking at this? Um, what are the problems that they've, they've found in investigating this question, whether we're talking about COVID testing or climate change or prevalence of dementia, or whatever it is that we're looking into? Uh, there's a story to be told about the process of discovery and the uncertainties and all of that. That, to me, is super interesting. And I, I want to interest other people in it as well. Your, your personal sense of curiosity seems to have really driven you to, some, to, to tell some really interesting stories. And I think that's a, that's a powerful connection. I, I, was in, I was really intrigued and also uh, really happy to see the celebration of statistical bedrocks. In the you know kind of the celebration of the importance of official statistics in in society, and I think these are these are stories that are, are and, and actions and activities that are not well appreciated generally. So you know what what kind of drove you to to, to pull that out as one of your your top ten? Yes, I mean, it, in a way, I'm violating my own, my own rule, right? I'm supposed to be giving people ten rules for thinking clearly about the numbers, and really that chapter, which I think is chapter eight is really just a, a chapter telling people to stop and appreciate what is done for them mm. by, done for all of us, uh, by statisticians uh, working uh, often for government agencies, not always for government agencies around the world, uh, a really thankless task. Uh, they, they get dismissed as bean counters and as irrelevant at best, um, or accused of lying and fraud or threatened in some cases. Uh, and I wanted to tell some of the stories of these statisticians and the work they do and why it matters. And um, I think one of the best ways to understand why it matters is to show what happens when those official statisticians come under attack uh, one way or another. Sometimes it's very crude uh, you know, to be threatened with your, having your family killed, uh, as I was told happened to one uh, African statistician who for obvious reasons shall remain nameless. Or more subtle stuff like, um, you know, simply having having your data released to politicians before it's released to the the rest of the country. And what what does that do for the reputation of the data? And what are the side effects of, of that privileged pre-release access? Which I'm very pleased to say the Royal Statistical Society has successfully campaigned hard hard against in the UK. Um, but to tell those stories of those those people, sometimes very brave people, and how important their work is. Uh, it mattered to me. And I should say that the work, that work is for all of us because I, I, I talked about the, the Rayner review in, in the UK in, in the 1980s under the Margaret Thatcher's government, where Sir Derek Rayner, who was a uh, high street retailer, he ran a, a chain of, um, of shops called Marks and Spencer's, which is, you know, great 
a brand name in the UK. He was brought in to think about how the UK government used statistics. And he thought of it as a management problem. You know, the government needs to make decisions and statistics are an input into those decisions. And we gather the statistics that you know, are useful to help us make decisions. And that sounds very reasonable. There's a lot of truth in that. That is one of the reasons why we collect official statistics. But it's, it's seductive because if you go too far with that, you start to realize you, that gives you a sense that all oh, the statistics are, they're private, we don't need to release them. They're for special people, important people, not for ordinary people. And actually the statistics are gonna be more robust, more respected, more scrutinized if they are for everybody to use as a, as a resource. And that was a point I wanted to underline. And, and I guess this is also a way we build trust in statistics because another argument the, of the book is that, uh, we, or maybe it was actually in a conversation you and I had separately was that we're not actually in a post-truth age, we're more in a post-trust age. And that's not to say that we should immediately trust everybody, um, trust is earned, but that actually we don't, we don't uh, allow ourselves to trust as much as we perhaps should, or we trust the wrong people. Absolutely, we're we're very selective in our in our trust and selective in our skepticism, and um, uh, we should be selective. You don't want to trust everything and everybody, but perhaps we're we're selective in the wrong way. We trust people whether you know on the perception that they're they're on our side, for example. So I wanted to examine that idea, and I was very struck by the the work that uh, the philosopher Nora O'Neill has done on trust, and and she says yes, you've got to be discriminating in your trust. You've got to trust certain institutions or certain people to do certain particular things, and you've got to have a good reason to trust them. You don't just sort of generically just trust everyone, anyone to do anything. So given that that's how we should think about trust, you, you want to build trustworthiness. If you're uh, working in official statistics, you want to build the trustworthiness of official statistics. Or if you're producing algorithms, um, you want to establish the trustworthiness of your algorithms. How is it that you do that? And uh, Baroness O'Neill had uh, four um, items on a checklist that I thought were very useful. Having named them, I'll, pro I'll probably only come up with two or three of them, but she said, okay, first of all, you know, the data need to be, uh, need to be accessible. Like an expert needs to be able to get at them and evaluate them and say, yes, this algorithm, for example, is fit for its purpose or it's not. But they also need to be accessible by ordinary people. The data need to be there, easily downloadable from, from the internet in a, in a straightforwardly useful um, uh, format. Uh, and they need to be useful. You know, if, if there are data, for example, about um, uh, cancer risk, uh, I'm trying to evaluate my cancer risk, the data need to be presented in a way that makes some kind of sense to me. So all, all of these, these are sort of different aspects of transparency. It's very easy to talk about transparency as a sort of panacea. But actually, when you get down to it, um, this thing that Baroness O'Neill calls uh, intelligent openness is a particular kind of transparency that lets people uh, access the data they need to access and feel confident that experts are able to really scrutinize it in a way that ordinary people might not be able to. Uh, it's quite striking that a lot of the algorithms, um, I, I know that uh, you'll, you'll be hearing from Tamandra uh, Harkness for shortly, written a wonderful book about algorithms. A lot of the algorithms that we um, sort of are making decisions about us, uh, are claims are made for them and those claims are, are not accessible. Experts can't really evaluate whether those claims are true. We don't know what the algorithms are doing. We don't know why they're doing it. Um, the algorithms are not for us. They're the hammers and we're the nails. Mm -hmm. So you know, in order to push, push that idea quite strongly, Tim, before we start taking questions from the audience, I do want to ask one question about one of the rules that you have in your book. Um, I started this episode talking about sort of alluding to this idea of misinformation. It's a constant thing that we are hearing covered and talked about in US media. I'm not sure what it's like in UK media, but you have a rule that says, remember that misinformation can be beautiful too. And I wondered if you could just talk before we again go to questions from the audience. Um, if you could sort of explain why you felt like driven to, to write that particular chapter and sort of what the maybe underlying philosophy of it is. Yes, so that's a chapter really um, particularly pinned around the work of Florence Nightingale, one of the, the, uh, 
the, the great, great uh, early members of the Royal Statistical Society and the first female fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. And um, I know you recently had an excellent episode of Stats and Stories about 19th century data visualizers, uh, in, including Florence Nightingale. I wanted to talk about her work and what it teaches us today. And um, one of the tensions in data visualization is um, it's, it's very easy to get uh, caught up in just how cool a graph looks, uh, you know, how, how original the presentation is. Um, there's some wonderful, wonderful examples. They can be so wonderful that they distract from the fact that maybe the underlying data is junk. Uh, and you don't, you don't question the underlying data because the, because the graphic looks so cool. So I wanted to, to, to think about that. And from the, from the point of view of the person building the graphic, building the visualization, uh, how, how do you want to play it super straight? Just the facts? Uh, how much are you able to spin a story? How much are you able to make an argument? And I think Florence Nightingale is notable for, um, for treading that line very well. Her graphs are in some ways a little bit naughty. They, they really emphasize certain elements of the data. You could present in a much more straightforward way and you might draw different conclusions. However, I think she was on the side of the angels because ultimately all the data is there in, in the graph. The data is very rigorous and she was right. She was absolutely right in the messages that she was uh, putting across using her graphics. So I, I felt that she was an example of someone who'd walked that tightrope, but it is very difficult to walk. So I'm gonna, uh, we've, we've got some questions coming in and I'm gonna try and collapse two of them together that seem semi-related, but I'm probably not gonna do this in a very elegant way. Um, so the one person is asking about whether you deal with the effect of political tribalization, whether in the UK or USA on people's decisions to trust. And one that sort of seems related, just came in right above it, related to the, this um, drumbeat about sort of saving um, 50 million pounds a day that was used in the in the Brexit debate and sort of what your thoughts were on sort of the use of of numbers and what this person says is a crooked way. I, you know, I'm not familiar with all of the rhetoric that was around Brexit in the lead up, so I'm going to trust them. But so those seemed kind of related, this issue of, of whether you deal with tribalization and, and this issue of trust around political rhetoric at all in the book. Yeah, so I do I do talk about tribal uh, tribal identity and uh, and polarization a lot. I mean, it's very much on my mind, um, and it's a really difficult thing to to overcome because for, for most of us, um, th those political identities are very strong. Those cultural identities are are very strong, and um, and to be honest, if you think about an issue like global warming, what I personally think about global warming doesn't make any difference to the climate. Like there's eight billion of us on this planet. So whether I you know, stop driving my car or something, that's not going to make any difference. But it's going to make a huge difference to me what my friends think of me. Am I the right kind of person? Do I have the right kind of attitude about global warming? And there's a story in the book about people who are in these quite tense positions, for example, um, farmers in the Midwest uh, whose crops are suffering because of climate change, and yet because of the political environment in their states, can't really use the phrase climate change and how they thread that needle. Uh, it's very interesting to watch. So yeah, I, I do talk about that. Um, specifically the Brexit referendum, um, there was this notorious claim uh, painted on the side of a bus uh, that um, leaving the EU would, would save 350 million pounds uh, a week. Uh, and uh, I think what's really interesting about that claim uh, and the way it was dealt with by fact checkers, in, including um, more or less in, in fact checking mode, is that um, it was very useful to the people making that claim that it be seen to be false. Uh, if people had, had basically said, oh yeah, that seems a bit high, but whatever, and got on and continued with the argument, um, that would have been, uh, you know, that wouldn't have worked for them. They, they, they wanted to be called out as liars mm -hmm. and they wanted the debate to be about whether, whether they were lying and how much they were lying because then it made the entire debate about well how much money do we send to the EU and how much money could we save by leaving the EU maybe it's mm -hmm. not that much maybe it's not as much as 350 maybe it's 200 maybe it's 100 but no matter what the figure is as long as you're going to save some money by leaving the EU wouldn't you want to leave the EU so um, th this was you know a real light bulb moment for me to realize that to simply explain that that's not 
true, that thing on the bus is not true, doesn't, doesn't help anybody understand the world, doesn't help anybody understand the issues. And, um, but it's, a, it's, it's difficult because you don't want to leave an untrue claim unchallenged. Um, but I, I mean, you, I continue to see this in the US election. Um, it, it's pretty clear that um, there are certain statements being made with the express intention of being identified as lies, uh, because that's a way of driving the narrative. Uh, I don't have a simple answer for any of this, but mm -hmm. it's, I think it's important to notice that that's one of the things that's going on. Tim Andra, did you have a question? Yeah, since I'm, uh, since I'm in real life, right here in the room as it were and in the podcast probably in the next episode I guess I it's just that Tim you, know, you and I both use the media to some extent to talk about these issues directly to the public I mean more or less as does fantastic work in just as you say raising the deeper ideas and the deeper questions alongside simple fact checking given that I mean I think I don't know maybe you'd agree that actually given the public more confidence and better tools to do this work for themselves is really important thing what else could we be doing in the media to get people to be i know more curious more open more skeptical more confident more skilled what what do we need to do and how could we better do it uh it's a great question i mean one of the things i'm trying to do in the book is to encourage people to to realize that a lot of this stuff is not actually that hard there are very, very complex technical questions in statistics, um, but generally it's the easy questions that give you most of the insight in most of the things that we're discussing. Um, you know, maybe a Google search, maybe some time with a calculator would, would, would help you check things. But so that, that's one of the things I, I want people to realize. Um, and one nice little uh, idea that I got from uh, a writer called Andrew Elliott is the idea of a landmark number. If you carry around a few numbers in your head, like oh, population of the UK is about 65 million. Um, the budget of the National Health Service in the UK is about 125 billion pounds. Um, once you have a few of these numbers in your head, uh, you can start to put other numbers into context really, really easily. Um, so uh, Matthew Hancock, the um, health secretary in the UK, uh, recently said, oh, if, if everyone who was overweight lost um, five pounds, that it would save the NHS, I forget, I think it was 100 million, might have been 200 million, um, uh, over five years. And when you start picking that apart, you go, okay, so 100 million over five years is, uh, is 20 million a year. There are 60 million people in the country. That's, that's 30 pence per person per year. Uh, that's not, but people were emailing me and going, is it true? How does he know this? How can he make this claim? And, and I, I was saying, you don't need to evaluate the claim. You just need to know that the claim is that if a lot of people lost a lot of weight, it wouldn't really make any difference to anything. That's the, that's the claim. <laughs> so, um, but I think by showing people the working and showing people that this, is, this isn't so complicated, the questions you need to ask, uh, you know, is it a big number? Is there a comparison? Can I compare this number to, to something else? Do I really understand uh, what's being described here? Uh, those questions anybody can ask it's often not very difficult to get the answers either. And I, th I hope that that is, is quite empowering. I'm gonna squeeze in, I think, two questions from the audience uh, before we wrap up. One very short, are you reading the audio book version of your book, Tim? Uh, yes, I did read the audio book. Uh, it was not a short process, took 20 hours, a <laughs> uh, lot of honey and lemon. Um, uh, I, this is my ninth book. I've never done the audio book of any, uh, any of my books before, but because uh, it's so closely associated with the radio work that I do. I felt I had to do it this time. And it was um, less unpleasant than I thought to be forced to read all my own words back again. But it wasn't as, was, wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. We, we've had a couple of questions come in about coronavirus stuff. And I'm, um, so I'm going to ask, I think, the, the last one that came in. Um, sort of what do you think about implications for trust of the wide pre-release access to COVID statistics? Um, presented by politicians at the number 10 daily press conferences during the height of the, the pandemic. I, I, I don't really understand why it is that politicians need pre-release access to anything. Uh, the argument that is always made is, well, you know, they need time to prepare their response and their rebuttal. 
And I don't know what the situation is with the, with the pre-release access to, to these uh, coronavirus statistics, but in the case of unemployment statistics, if I remember rightly, there were about 100 people in uh, politics of government with pre-release access. And why do you need 100 people to have pre-release access uh, in order to prepare some kind of press release or rebuttal? It was absolutely bizarre. And of course, the, it turns out that that data, there was strong evidence that that data was leaking and being used for insider trading. So. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's helpful. Um, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of other things to worry about in the way that those statistics are presented. Um, the UK government has, has done some slightly weird things with targets. Um, but, you know, I, it, it's, it's best to have maximum transparency. And mm -hmm. one of the features of maximum transparency is everyone gets the data at the same time. And I don't really see why that would be so hard. So final question, it's related to coronavirus. I was trying to find this when I was trying to ask that last question. Um, someone is asking you whether you found the coronavirus specials were more or less emotionally challenging. Um, it, it was hard. Um, it, was, it was hard because uh, I was making them during lockdown uh, in a house with uh, my three children in the house, all trying to tiptoe around and keep quiet uh, underneath a duvet. Um, a, a good friend of mine, the, uh, Peter Sinclair, the man who persuaded me to become an economist, had died of coronavirus very early on. Um, and I actually had a, a bike accident and managed to quite badly injure my face. So the whole, I was sort of speaking, I can hear when I listen to the early episodes, I can hear the kind of weird distortion of my mouth. So there was a lot going on um, personally before we even got to the fact that the most extraordinary uh, tra national and international trauma was taking place. That, depending on how you measure, 65,000 people in the UK alone uh, had, had died in, in the first wave. So, so that, that was hard. That said, I, I had produced the first draft of the book and was just about to send it to the publishers when lockdown began, making all of these arguments about how important the numbers were about all the invisible things in the world that we couldn't see without statistics, that they weren't just about uh, tricks, they were about solving really vital life or death questions. And just as I was about to send off the, the manuscript, in comes lockdown, in comes coronavirus, the more or less specials begin. And I realized this is really underlining what I was trying to say with the book. Uh, and uh, so the, the one silver lining I take is that the, the messages that I've been trying to put across and that my fellow nerds have been trying to put across about that this stuff matters. It's not just about bullshit, for, for, forgive the, my, my language, it's not just about disinformation, it's about what's true. Um, the, the pandemic has made that case for us and, and it was, I, was, I felt quite lucky at least in one element, which is the timing, I had a chance to revise the book. Uh, with that in mind. Well, Tim, that's all the time we have for this episode of Stats and Stories. Thank you so much for being here and joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. And I'd also like to thank the Royal Statistical Society for hosting us. Stats and Stories is a partnership between Miami University's Departments of Statistics and Media, Journalism and Film and the American Statistical Association. You can follow us on Twitter, Apple Podcasts or other places where you can find podcasts. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the program, send your email to statsandstories at miamioh.edu or check us out at statsandstories.net. And be sure to listen for future editions of Stats and Stories where we discuss the statistics behind the stories and the stories behind the statistics. Statistics is generally a field not known for its humor, at least to the broad public. Although I will say John Baylor has been an exception in my life. That's because um, you laugh at me. That's, uh, <laughs> that's... <laughs> It's a shame though, because humor is a way to make complicated subjects like statistics or big data data accessible to general audiences. The intersection of humor and stats is a focus of this episode of Stats and Stories coming to you from the annual meeting of the Royal Statistical Society. I'm Rosemary Mary Pennington. Stats and Stories is a production of Miami University's Departments of Statistics and Media, Journalism and Film, as well as the American Statistical Association. Joining me as panelists are John Baylor, Chair of Miami Statistics Department, and Brian Tarrin, Editor of Significance Magazine. Our guest is writer, comedian, and presenter, Tamandra Harkness. Harkness writes and presents BBC Radio 4 documentaries, including the series Future Proofing and How to Disagree. 
and are you a numbers person for BBC World Service? I frankly am not. She formed the UK's first comedy science double act with neuroscientist Dr. Helen Pilcher and has performed scientific and mathematical comedy from Australia to Pennsylvania with partners including stand-up mathematician Matt Parker and Socrates the Rat. Her latest solo show, Take a Risk, hit the 2019 Edinburgh Festival Fringe with randomized audience participation and an electric shock machine. A fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, she's a founding <coughs> member of their special interest group on data ethics. Tamandra's book, Big Data Does Size Matter, was published by Bloomsbury Sigma in 2016. Tamandra, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. I, I'm just going to ask that I think the obvious question is how does a comedian take on technology and math and science as a focus of her work? That's a relief because I thought you were going to ask about the electric shock machine. <laughs> I do uh, want to know about that. That's maybe, my question, Tamandra. I'm going to ask that next. I may be the only fellow of the Royal Statistical Society who owns my own electric shock machine. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, interestingly, you see, there's a lot of people now who use comedy as a way of getting across their their specialist subject, whether it's science or maths or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, math. And I came the other way. I came in the other direction. I was already a professional stand-up comedian. And so was Dr. Helen Pilcher, although she had a day job at the time. And we met at a meeting at the Royal Society. Uh, on stem cells because I was trying to write something about it and we bumped into each other in the coffee room and I was really surprised because I'd only ever seen her in rooms above pubs making jokes about beer bellies <laughs> and there she was looking really smart with a badge on and so I sidled over and went what are you doing here and she said I'm a stem cell scientist that's my day job what are you doing here <laughs> and so we went oh we should do some comedy about science because we were both getting really bored with the things that comedy was always about. It was always about the differences between men and women and about drugs and about sex, about alcohol. And we just wanted to do some comedy about something more interesting. Although ironically, when I look back at the things I've done comedy about, I have actually done now comedy about the differences between men and women and, uh, and sex and drugs, but from a scientific and mathematical mm -hmm. point of view. So it was really for me, and then I went on to do uh, a degree in maths and statistics with the Open University. But for me, it was comedy that reignited my curiosity, really, about, about science and mathematics and statistics. So it's more the other way around for me. It's less, why do you use comedy to talk about mathematics? It's more, how did you end up in mathematics having started out with mm -hmm. comedy? <laughs> You know, I think there's an element of of uh, you have to change hearts before you change heads, and that that you you know that the comedy is is opening up to message. It's engaging and getting, you know, getting you ex getting excitement and and interest. And if you can get the interest, then then the messaging can also be connected to it. So that's yeah, that all of that is true. I think, and, and a lot of people do use it for that. But absolutely, genuinely, for me, it was the other way around. I. I like doing comedy because I like making people think. That's that's oh. absolutely true. I always have. Uh, I've always been more interested in the kind of comedy where people laugh and then go, ooh, it's interesting. Why did I laugh at that? Uh, because it opens people's minds up a bit. It catches them unawares. And also, of course, it's enjoyable, which is always a plus. <laughs> and then it was my curiosity then about science and mathematics that I kind of came to in that direction and then I thought well look you know if I find it interesting why wouldn't anybody else find it interesting and it does as I say it does make a change from talking about the same old same old thing because this was back in well I think it's back in 2000 or 2001 so now there are a lot of good people doing good comedy about science statistics mathematics at the time we genuinely were the first two people in the UK I think there were a couple of guys in Australia doing it uh, and everyone else had exactly that. You, you do comedy about what? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you make people think uh, with an electric shock machine? What's the... Uh... <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the electric shock machine, I first got it when I did a show about brain science and gender, uh, co-starring Socrates the Rat, uh, whose job was to be male and a rat and <laughs> I uh, one of the 
What are the differences that psychologists find, on average, between uh, populations of uh, grown-up men and women is that, on average, men tend to be more open to taking risks. And I wanted something that I could demonstrate this very graphically to the audience, preferably with audience participation. So I wrote to a psychologist friend of mine and said, you do research into pain, don't you? Is there a, like a civilian version of the equipment you use that I could buy to do you know, harmless pain on an, an audience member? <laughs> and he said, this is great timing. I'm about to relocate to Singapore. I have an electric shop machine. I don't want to take it with me. It's yours. And so he gave me this laboratory standard machine with all the safety instructions, it's got a seven page risk assessment and everything. And I would invite people in the audience in the show about uh, sex differences to to get up and uh, and basically gamble, take a 50 50 bet. And if they lost the bet, I'd get to give them an electric shock. And if they won the bet, they got to give me an electric shock and I gave them some money. And I have to say, whoever was flipping the coins on that, who is another audience member, I, let's just say I look back at the end of the tour and I was well down on money and electric <laughs> shocks. So I don't think there was fair coin action going on there. Uh, and then when I went on to do a show about risk, this was a very obvious thing. And I would, again, I basically I used it for gambling to let people in the audience think about their own decision making around risk. And, uh, and your previous guest, Tim Harford, I think, has probably looked at things around this where it's never a purely mathematical calculation. There are always psychological elements. It's never just about going, well, on average, I will win if I do this, because you might say, well, I'm prepared to take quite a large risk of a very small electric shock, but I'm not prepared to take even a very small risk of a very large electric shock because there's a kind of maximum amount of pain that I'm prepared to risk. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, I would get people randomly selected from the audience and offer them the chance to, to do this gamble about whether to get an electric shock or not as a way of saying, look, whenever we make these decisions, it's not just about can you do arithmetic in your head? It's always in the context of much wider decisions that we make. I love that you phrased it, uh, harmless pain. <laughs> yeah. I, I would not do that because any pain to me feels harmful. <laughs> Oh, well, there is actually, I had to get people to sign a consent form yeah. uh, because people with a pacemaker, for example, it's very okay. dangerous for them uh, and certain other medical conditions. Also, it really ups the ante on stage when some audience volunteer is having to read a consent form and sign <laughs> it. It ups the fear level, which makes the whole thing more dramatic. And it also gives them a little point where they could elegantly back out. You know, if they're having second thoughts, they could read it and go, no, I've got, I've got a medical condition. No, I can't. I can't do this. You know, in, in reading through your, your, your big data book, I mean, I, I really liked, I liked the historical tour of kind of thinking about data and society and in statistics and also about computing and how that, that emerged. And then you, you have this, this, this organizing statement here of data where you touch on these, these different components. Would you, could you kind of summarize for, for folks that haven't read it, how you've organized your thinking about big data? Oh, my backronym. Your yes. backronym. Yes. Backronym, yeah. No, I, I thought everybody knew this word, backronym, which is where you want an acronym. So you, you want a word that <laughs> spells out your ideas, but then you reverse engineer it to get the word that you wanted. So I thought I would do this uh, so that I could get data, D-A-T-A. Uh, now, obviously, big data is partly big. There is a lot of it. That is part of the point. But I thought it's not just that. It's not just that there's more of it than there used to be. It's also these other things. And I, and I did. I managed to get them to fit DATA. So D is for different or diverse or dimensions, if you want to get a bit technical. The idea that you can have different types of data. And when you combine them, you get a multi-dimensional picture, whether it's of an individual or something that you're studying. Uh, so, I mean, the best example I got from that was a brain scientist called Professor Paul Matthews, who said, if you have lots of brain scans, for example, he said, I have brain scans, but if you have lots of brain scans, that's just large data. Big data is when you combine the brain scans, the patient records, the postcodes where the patients have lived, the weather records of those postcodes, 
And then you put them all together and you ask a different question from what the people were collecting the data for. In his case, he wanted to know how many hours of sunshine had the patients had? Did that correlate with the progression of their illness? So that's D, so it's diverse, different dimensions. Uh, a is for automatic, because so many things we do now just automatically generate data. So you, you almost like collect it by default. T is for time, because things are collected pretty much in real time, it lends itself really well to making a time series and you can project that into the future and see how things are going to change. And then the other A is for, for AI, for artificial intelligence, because the programs used to analyze the data very often are what you might call artificial intelligence. I mean, I, I don't want to make claims that it can think, but there's, there's an element of unsupervised processing where instead of saying, follow every step in this program, you say to the computer, uh, I want you to sort these brains into sick and well or male and female and I'm going to give you one data set that's pre-sorted and I'm going to let you deduce the rules that you need to follow to, to sort the rest of the data. So that's different diverse automatic time and AI. On, on the subject of algorithms um, and, and AI I guess you, uh, you've been doing a lot of writing recently on the Ofqual I think I saw, was it a tweet that you said about you've become a uh, overnight expert in Ofqual's algorithm? So for, for US listeners, this is where in England, the uh, in the absence of exams because of COVID-19, grades were issued based on uh, teacher or, or, or center assessment uh, or the schools and colleges submitted the predicted grades. Uh, the government essentially ignored those using an algorithm uh, to produce some grades that were lower than what the students were expecting. There was a protest, there was a reversal. Enter Timanja to explain the situation <laughs> more clearly. <laughs> well, it, well, you've explained it quite well, actually. Yes, this, this was a classic case where uh, a radio program rang up and said, we're covering this algorithm thing. Could you come on and just explain how it works for us? And I said, okay, well, you know, I understand algorithms in general. I could do a bit of research into this one and, and come on. And so did lightning research for two hours and came on the radio program and said, well, you know, you would expect that if you're not holding the exams, then you would take the predicted grades that the teachers had given, which are often based on previous exams that kid has taken, at least as your starting point. But they didn't do that. They went, what's really important to us is that the overall pattern of the grades will closely resemble the previous three years. So what we're going to do is for each school, we will take their results for the previous three years and we'll get an average of those and we'll say, OK, well, those are the grades that your school is going to get this year. This this pattern, you know, so many A's, so many B's and so on. And then, oh, OK, how are we going to decide which kid gets which one? Ah, well, we'll get the teachers to rank them in order from best to worst. And then we've already got this, this selection box of grades that we've decided your school is getting and we'll give them out in that order from top to bottom. And that was what they did. The only role that the kids exam results that the actual kid getting this result out of the algorithm, the only role their previous exam results played was as a whole class, as a whole group, they would say, if they have done spectacularly better or worse than previous years, then we'll adjust it upwards or downwards. Or if they were in a very small subject group, at which point if they were like 10 or eight kids in a class, off quite went, yeah, OK, it's probably not fair then to just allocate them the same as previous years. So in that case, we will take them into account. But I just thought it was A, an astonishing decision and B, also horribly typical, in fact, of the way a lot of algorithms work that make decisions about us, that really they're minimally based on anything we do or are or have done very largely based on what the population of people who are deemed to be like us have done in the past. Were you surprised that that, you know, just to, to see those same issues coming up? I mean, it was four years ago, your book was published and you were warning about these sorts of things back then, right? <laughs> We've not moved on a great deal, I guess you would say. It's well, yes and no. I mean, I think we're a bit more aware of these things, but yes, it is a bit astonishing to see that the whole juggernaut, if you like, rumbles on the same way. And it, I mean, in fact, that's the thing that I'm interested in now and looking at now is to say, well, let's get fixated on the technology here. Because it's not like, 
you know, it isn't like the technology is a robot that has arrived from space with sentience and say, I am the algorithm and I'm in charge now. Human beings build this stuff. Human beings decide what data to collect. This is all human beings doing this. The question really is, what is it about us? What is it about human beings here and now at this point in history that makes us so very keen to hand over decisions to algorithms? No matter how many times we see how flawed and how biased and how incomplete they can be, there still seems to be this urge to hand over human judgment and decision making to an algorithm. You're listening to Stats and Stories, recording at the annual meeting of the Royal Statistical Society. Our guest is writer, comedian, and presenter Tamandra Harkness. Why? So you sort of talked about how now, like, we need to sort of step back a little bit from our trust in algorithms. I guess I, the question I wanted to pose is sort of why you felt compelled to write about big data in the first place. There's a lot of people writing about and publishing on big data. What was it that made you feel like you had to publish and write that book? Well, it actually, it started a few years before with me getting interested in statistics. And I doubt that Brian remembers this, but the first thing I ever wrote for Significance magazine was an article called Seduced by Stats? Question mark, which was probably about the time that Matt Park and I were doing the show called The Maths of Death on the Fringe. And it was because I, I was confused because, you know, I really like maths. That's why I went back and studied it again. I, I've always liked it, but I've always realized that this is a kind of a minority sport, really. Most <laughs> people don't like mathematics and they'd be very happy to never have to look at it again. And yet those same people were getting really excited about statistics. They were getting really excited about uh, infographic displays in newspapers, what your previous guest, Tim Harford, was talking about. And I thought, well, this is odd because I like statistics. I'm quite excited about what you can do with them. But I know for a fact that all of you people really hate mathematics. So why are you getting so excited about some graphs? What, you know, it's as if you think here's some magical oracle of objective truth that in a, in a difficult time where nobody really knows what's going on, you can at least look at the numbers and the numbers will appear in shining light and tell you what to do. And then as things evolved, I started to see people talking about big data in the same way. And I was thinking, well, again, the kind of mathematical side of me goes, this is really exciting. Can you really do all this stuff just by collecting loads of data and applying mathematical processes to it? Because that's really exciting if it can do all the things that you're claiming. This could really transform loads of things. But on the other hand, is this those same people that got really excited about infographics in newspapers? Are they now getting really excited about big data because it's big and shiny and I don't understand it? So maybe it's really clever. And in fact, I, I talked to a, an American scholar called Christine Rosen, who was looking at it. And, and I said to her, you know, have you got a definition of big data? because this is this when I was making a program with that for Radio 4 about it. And she said, yes, it's an oracle. People look at it oh. and they think it's going to give them all the answers. So, so it was that really. I mean, you know, part of it was my mathematical interest and me going, look, isn't this clever? You get all this data and you do this to it and it tells you this thing that you never knew before. And I, I do still find that really exciting. But then the other bit of me was, you know, me as a citizen, if you like, going, why are we so convinced that all these quite difficult and messy and complicated human problems can be solved if you just collect enough data and put it into a big enough computer. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pull in uh, a question from the audience and this is a reminder, if you have questions for Tamandra, we will try to get to them um, throughout the rest of the show and certainly at the end. But someone just posed a question, whose decisions do you think are more biased, algorithms or people? And I felt like a nice sort of question to sort of scoop in there. That's a brilliant question. That is a brilliant question. I mean, I think it partly underlies the urge to get an algorithm in. You think, well, I know that I'm biased and I'm full of all these shortcuts and loyalties and emotions. Uh, so maybe an algorithm could step back from that and be more objective. Well, I think there's two things at play. One of them is that algorithms are made and designed by people. They are as flawed and imperfect as the people that build them. The advantage they have, if you like, is that by building an algorithm, you kind of have to 
build assumptions into it, but it does help you be more aware of what the assumptions are that you're building in. And even though you can't have a fair algorithm in an unfair world, I mean, for example, to go back to the A-level schools results algorithm, the truth is that in a normal year when the kids took exams, a lot of them would find that their exam results were lower than the teachers had predicted. So this does tell us something about the, the unfairness of the school system, probably. Uh, but in a normal year, the kids get to take the exam themselves. So at least they get to affect their own outcome. Uh, and this year they didn't. So you can't actually have an algorithm that is going to dish out a completely fair result because the world is not fair. What you can do is say, OK, well, but we need to be explicit about what kind of fairness are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve everybody goes in on an equal basis, in which case we know that what comes out will be unfair because it's an unfair world. Or are we going to say we want things to come out that look fair by some other measure, in which case maybe we have to adjust people and not treat them fairly on the way in. I mean, of course, we're a bit defensive. They said, well, we have tested our algorithm by all these measures. We've tested them like, are, are, are poorer children going to be disadvantaged? No. Are uh, boys or girls going to be disadvantaged? No. Are these different ethnic groups going to be disadvantaged? No. All these subpopulations are going to come out roughly as in the same state as they would if they'd taken the exams. So on a population level, they said, we've been totally fair. Look, every subpopulation has been treated fairly. It's like, yeah, but every individual hasn't been treated fairly. So, so that I think it can be good that building an algorithm makes you think makes you decide, well, what does fairness look like? What kind of fairness do we want? And also, by the way, this reveals to us what the unfairnesses are in the world. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing is, there's also this slightly underlying assumption that people are basically all biased and prejudiced and awful. And I think you have to remember the difference between algorithms and people is that a person can reflect on themselves and go, oh, yeah, actually I actually just caught myself assuming that you know, all boys were like this. But actually, you know, even if even if the data says that on average more boys are like this, I, I shouldn't assume that of every boy that I meet. And therefore, I'm going to change my attitude in future and deliberately try not to think that and deliberately set myself up so that I don't slide into those habits. Whereas an algorithm has no moral sense. An algorithm isn't going to go that was wrong. An algorithm is going to do exactly what you programmed it to do. So I, you know, one thing about the the algorithms, I wonder. I, I love this idea that that you've you've raised this this issue of you know, turning over human judgments to algorithms. But I also I also wonder if if it's how people sell algorithms and the results of algorithms that perhaps they sell them as if they have this 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 um, level of precision that they really don't have. That they they oversell predict the precision and undersell the uncertainty and variability that are baked into this. Yeah, I think that's that's a point very well made. And and again, it's like there is just the very basic thing of especially if you're a, if you're a corporate entity and you're designing an algorithm, you go, hey, our magic algorithm will help you do this, and you go, you've just given me two decimal places there. So that basically means you're making this up. I'm not going to take you seriously at all. Uh, and this this is a problem sometimes that you want to question how did you get those outcomes? And especially if they're private companies, they go, well, we can't tell you. It's a, it's a statute, it's a, it's a secret, it's our commercial secret. But the other thing is, I think that it's, it's that uncertainty question, which I think is a much bigger question. Mm -hmm. I think we look to things that have numbers attached for certainty. I think that's that's one of the very deep appeals at the moment of statistics and data and numbers is that the world is very uncertain, it's very unpredictable. Uh, it feels it feels risky, even though actually it's safer than any other period in history. Still, even even in spite of a pandemic, it's still a very safe period. But because it's hard to make sense of, because it's a world that's changing socially and politically as well as everything else, I think people feel very insecure. They they feel fearful about the future. And they hope that numbers and data will give them something very definite. So you may know that the future is going to be awful, but at least you'll know it's going to be awful in with mathematical precision. Whereas, of course, all, all statisticians know that 
like uh, approximately 95% of your job, uh, you know, <laughs> to two or three uh, plus either side is actually just quantifying uncertainty is saying, mm -hmm. well, we think it's probably within this range, but the, 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 like the more you narrow that down, the less certain you can be about it. That, you know, you could look at you could easily look at the whole of Britain and go, well, we're 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 certain London is in there somewhere, but then the smaller the area you you pull out, the less certain you are London is in it, unless you know it's London. Mm. So I think that I think more being more upfront about uncertainty would really help in a lot of a lot of cases. Just we all need to learn to accept risk, not just in the sense of going out on your bicycle and getting in a terrible accident like poor Tim did, but but risk in the sense that you don't know what the future is going to be. And sometimes you don't even know things about the present. You know, we don't really know how many people have coronavirus. We can make an estimate by various methods and we can have various figures and go, OK, well, these are different, but they give us a ballpark figure. But we don't know. and We probably never will know. And what we have to do is become better at making decisions, accepting that we don't know things for certain. And all we can really do is get an idea of roughly what something is and how how uncertain it is. So we have Tim Harford still with us, and I believe he has a question for you, Tamandra. So, Tamandra, you you've raised a couple of times the the puzzle that we put so much trust in algorithms, and I wanted to ask you to about that a little bit more. I mean, the the A level predictions thing is a a really stark example. It was a situation where, if you put it baldly, the government said, we are going to cancel your exams because it's not safe. And then a computer will give you the grade that you would have got if you had sat the exams. Which, of course, when you put it like that, it can't possibly be true. Exactly. So how did they, how is it that they managed to fool themselves into thinking that it might be true? How did the rest of us uh, nod and accept, oh yeah, I, that, I suppose that'll do? And is there anything that we can do to have a more realistic view of what algorithms can and can't achieve? Because they've got their place, of course. Well, exactly. I, I mean, I, I part of me hopes that the fact we had teenagers out on the streets with signs that saying things we probably can't say in a podcast, mm -hmm. but they're very rude about what the algorithm could go do. Uh, I'd slightly hope that that will actually sink in and people will go, yeah, a lot of this is just hype and how could a, how could an algorithm ever possibly know that i don't know i do think it's less a sign of how powerful algorithms and data are and more a sign of how much we lack in in human fields of you know, politics economics philosophy even i mean we we do have a government in in the uk at the moment that is quite technocratic we i mean it's certainly Dominic Cummings, who's one of the chief advisors, is really, really keen on data and prediction and algorithms and getting more people into government that understand data, which, you know, one level would be great. It would be great if more of them understood stats and data. But they, there is a slight air of, well, yeah, you know, if we get enough clever people, enough data in, that will give us all the answers. And I rather want to say, but you're the government. You should have ideas. You should have policies. You should have principles. You should have a vision of where you want to take this country to and that's what's going to get us through and data and algorithms and however good they are can only be a means to help us get there they can they can possibly give us a better idea of where we are and a better idea of the outcomes if we do different things but they're not going to tell us what we should do mm -hmm. and I, I do think it's that I think it's a lack of direction a lack of vision a lack of self-confidence that leads us to put far too much confidence in algorithms. Uh, this, uh, that feels tied into a question we have, we got from an audience member who asks, if we're spending enough time scrutinizing the questions, we're trying to have big data answer for us. Oh, a question if we are. Uh, no, I don't think we are, no. <laughs> no. Um, no, I don't, I, but I think that's, that's a really good question exactly for that reason. I think if you formulate the question right, then finding the answer is often, much the easier part uh, and I think if you ask a lot of statisticians their job is to go in early and help people formulate the right question in the right way uh, I, I certainly I mean you know I would still say even though I scraped a 
maths and stats degree, I would still say I was more a writer than a statistician. And I always say, if I can ask the right questions, you know, I consider that a, a job well done. And I leave getting the answers to somebody else. So we have two, uh, two more comments that came through. One just from someone who said they attended your show at Fringe last year. Very entertaining and instructive, but they did not volunteer for the shock wager. <laughs> um, and then, so this is kind of related. Uh, so someone is asking if you would mind telling your favorite statistical joke. Well, they might have heard it before because it is my favorite. I do tell it all the time. But uh, why should you never tell a statistician he was average? Because it's mean. <laughs> oh, that sounds like one that John Baylor might have actually. Oh. <laughs> you know, so my, I have to tell you, Tamandra, my my family thought this was an impossibility that that, we, that there could be someone who could have have humor and statistics as part of their life. Oh well, it's actually, I have I have a worse one, uh, but it oh, may good. be it may be a bit UK specific. I don't know if I don't know if this will make sense to American audience, but uh, what is a statistician's favorite sandwich filling? Correlation chicken. <laughs> oh. <laughs> See, I don't know if you have coronation chicken. I America. I'm familiar like with it. American <laughs> listeners going, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Before we before we go, I saw you. So I was stalking you this morning as I did preparations, <laughs> and I saw that you tweeted out that you have a new piece out in Significance um, about. And I feared Brian would like me to ask about that um, about Thank John you. Grant. I don't know if I'm pronouncing John his Grant. Name. Yeah, I I am a bit obsessed actually. Brian, will so tell you, you called that. him a superhero of stats. Why? Yeah, well, because he so he was born 400 years ago this year, as I only discovered writing this piece for <laughs> significance, because uh, he makes a, a tiny appearance in my book because I, I try and get over the ideas, the sets ideas in the book by telling you the story of the person who first thought of them because they kind of make more sense. And he so he lived through the English Civil War. He fought in the English Civil War on the Parliament side. Waves of plague because he was in London. He was a founder member of the Royal Society in spite of just being a humble haberdasher. But he wrote this one book, which was about the bills of mortality, which is about the, the death records of what people had died of. And in this book, he just invented all these concepts which he needed to try and get information out of the data. He basically had this raw data for about... 50 or 60 years of bills of mortality. And he went through and he said, well, you know, but you can see these patterns. And if you do this, you can see that pattern. So he came up, for example, with the idea of excess deaths. He looked oh, wow. at it, he said, well, in this, you know, in this year, we say it's a bad plague year because there's this many plague deaths listed. But hang on, if we look at deaths from other diseases, in the years before and after this year, they were about seven or 8,000. And in this year, it's seven, it's, in this year, it's 18,000. So where did these 10,000 other deaths come from? There must have been more plague deaths than were written down as plague. And so many, so many ideas, which, you know, he didn't have the language for it, but he basically invented a lot of statistical ideas. And yet there's not, there's not a statue, there's not even a little plaque to say where he lived. Mm. Well, there should be. There should be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a campaign. He has a few fans, actually. I might just start a fan okay. club and go statue of John Graunt and then he lost everything in the Great Fire of London and then he was persecuted because he'd converted to being a Roman Catholic which at the time was very unpopular and basically died in poverty aged only 53. I know he's like his life is a roller coaster and he invented all these statistical ideas. He, there should be a Hollywood movie about him. If there's any Hollywood producers listening <laughs> write to me. That's, that's, I, that's our I biggest listener audience segment Tamandra. That's <laughs> That's that's clearly who we're appealing to in this this, this, this series. Absolutely, I I'm think, gonna, I I'm think gonna George launch. Clooney could totally play him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to launch uh, just to, to as we're wrapping up. John's question he normally asks is sort of maybe what advice would you give to statisticians who want to maybe not shock people in an audience, right? But maybe want to communicate. Um, to a broad public, what advice would you give to them as they're thinking about how to present their their research or or connect with with those those audiences outside the statistical community? Get a cute rat, but accept that everyone will <laughs> love the rat more than you. <laughs> uh, no, okay. Um, I think basically you've got to 
start where those people are. And I think this is always whether you're trying to do comedy or radio, write books or whatever you're trying to do. Just start where those people are. Listen to them more than you talk to them. Think about, well, what's, you know, what are they concerned with? What newspapers do they read? Have a look at their newspapers, see what the stories are, what the adverts are for. Those are the things that those people are interested in. Start from there uh, and, and go to where they are. Look for, look for things that will, that will arouse their emotions. I mean, to take us right back to where Tim Harford started us off, it's the feelings that will grab them and make them care. Uh, if you can't make them feel something about what you want to talk about, then why would they give you any attention at all? Well, that's great. And thank you so much for being here today. That's all the time we have for this episode, Tamandra. It's thank been an absolute Tamandra. pleasure. Thanks, Tamandra. Uh, we'd like to also thank the Royal Statistical Society for allowing us to record two programs um, as part of their annual meeting. Stats and Stories is a partnership between Miami University's Departments of Statistics and Media, Journalism and Film and the American Statistical Association. You can follow us on Twitter, Apple Podcasts or other places where you find podcasts. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the program, send your email to statsandstories at miamioh.edu or check us out at statsandstories.net and be sure to listen for future editions of Stats and Stories, where we discuss the statistics behind the stories and the stories behind the statistics.